I'm actually glad to, to be able to come and talk about something sort of out of the ordinary for me. Uh, I typically come and do e-commerce presentations because, as Mike said, I um, had a big hand in the development of Ubercart and then of Drupal Commerce. Uh, but I feel like that session is getting a little long in the tooth, and it's not really going to be interesting for everybody in a room that's come to a Drupal camp like this one. Uh, so instead, I'm going to talk about something completely different, uh, and I'm going to blame the GPL for Drupal's complexity. I'm going to, I'm going to say that uh, the GPL has made Drupal hard to use. And of course, I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek, uh, but I'll get to what I actually mean in just a couple of slides. Uh, but first, the whole personal introduction thing. Um, I have a family. We live in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, we moved there whenever this guy was in utero, so we could be near Christina's family. And we love Greenville, South Carolina, and I love the Southeast in general. And I'm really happy to be so close to Florida and beaches. Just I, I came from Louisville, Kentucky, uh, where we had great horse farms, but no beaches. And yeah, I'm much happier, much happier here in the Southeast. So, um, outside of Drupal and e-commerce stuff, uh, I also like. Uh, talking about REST and JavaScript and board games and indie game development and Lean Startup and et cetera, et cetera. So if anybody has any interest in those things, I'm more than happy to talk uh, and, and share about those things. Professionally, um, I'm one of the co-founders of Commerce Guys. Uh, we are a Drupal startup focused on e-commerce in Drupal. Uh, we build Drupal Commerce websites and then also write the Drupal Commerce software, the Commerce Kickstart distribution that Josh is going to talk about a little bit. Um, a sort of service marketplace that connects Drupal to third-party service providers. It's our take on the app store, meaning we don't actually sell apps. We just connect you to services. Um, and then we also are rocking a hosting platform that's going to launch in Portland uh, to try to sort of package together everything you need to do e-commerce on Drupal. Um, so that's why normally when I come to, present to, to conferences and camps, I'm sort of showing the latest uh, software that we've developed. I'm showing the latest features in Commerce Kickstart. Or trying to, you know, unveil the marketplace or something like that. But here I'm going to talk about something a little more boring, uh, or maybe something a little more exciting, uh, depending on who you are. And I'm, I'm talking about the GPL. This is a new, it's an animal, and that has something to do with the GPL. I'm not going to spill all the beans yet for the new folks. Um, but the, the the question you may be asking yourself is, why did I title this uh, session Drupal inverted the, or I'm sorry, the GPL inverted Drupal's learning curve? What does that even mean? Uh, am, I, am I trying to blame some sort of like piece of paper for our user experience? Uh, am I trying to say that uh, we have no control over our own destiny or the application that we've developed under the terms of this license? Um, obviously, I'm being a little reductionistic when I say that the GPL is responsible. But this is also a little reductionistic. Um, <coughs> and this is, this is a, a lovely graph of the Drupal learning curve. Uh, and I say it's reductionistic because... Well, like, like you're just doing different things on these lines than you are in this line um, before you have to, you know, pass the, I don't know, what, what's, the, what's the participle for someone who's been hanged? Um, the, the people that have died along the way to learning Drupal. What's that I, no, okay. Um, so so uh, this is reductionistic, my title's reductionistic, but really what I hope to do here is sort of increase our appreciation for the license and then also increase our appreciation for the people in our community that like really care about the license and licensing issues and ensuring that we are able to collaborate on this free software to make something uh, that can throw people off cliffs. Uh, so really what I meant to say is that the, the GPL uh, doesn't directly cause us to do anything, um, but it does provide us a safe place or safe environment to kind of uh, express ourselves in code. And, and the kind of code that we make because of our community ethos and because of the leadership of Dries and others in the community, is the kind of code that's designed to like work together and to be abstract and interoperable and reusable and not just a silo of functionality somewhere. And probably the, the clearest example I have of that is uh, the fact that, I, well, maybe I should actually ask, is, is anybody using an image gallery module on Drupal 7? such a thing even exist anymore? Is there, is there an image gallery module? Like that, was, that was like all the rage in Drupal like 4, 7, and 5. But, but along the way, we sort of decided, well, we don't just need like this sort of like one image gallery module because everybody wants like a different kind of image gallery. Let's instead make like image cache and then put that into cores, image styles, so we can just abstractly resize images and then maybe combine that with this views thing and then maybe combine that with a custom breadcrumb system and so on and so forth. We've, we've sort of 
valued the kind of people and lionized the kind of people that can create abstract systems that work together in ways that they never intended them to. That's what we do. That's what, that's what we, uh, we sort of value as a community. And the GPL gives us a safe place to do that. And, uh, and I guess I'll talk about why and why it's to blame for our complexity. But first, what is the GPL? A quick poll of the audience. Is, who here knows what the GPL is? Excellent. I'm glad that some of you don't. Okay, so of you that raised your hands, uh, what does it stand for? Great peanut lotion. Great peanut lotion? <laughs> General ah, thanks. General public license? That's a good option. I mean, it's not like the... Okay, I think it'd be much more interesting. Uh, <laughs> sorry, wrong slide. Yes, it is the general public license. Well, actually, until like last month, I thought the G stood for new. I had no clue that it stood for general public license. I, I don't know what I thought it meant. Um, I wasn't far off because it is the new general public license. I had reason to be mistaken, but I was corrected last month. Um, this is the license that governs the distribution of Drupal, uh, of the code that you all are learning to use or are developing uh, on the back of your own money or your client's money and then releasing for free. Um, it is the general public license, and it says a few things. Um, first of all, about itself, it says that it's interested in the free software movement. And, and I think they're being a little kitschy when they say it's free as in freedom. Because uh, I, I guess the, the sort of common way to talk about free software is to say it's free as in speech, not as in beer. Um, but they want to be like, you know, I guess like one level above, we're free as in freedom. Um, that's the new logo for the GPL V3. Um, but really it, what, it's, what it's saying is that it's not just about like price, it's about value. And what they really want people to be able to do is uh, to make sure that you are free to use the software however you want and to make sure that you can't do anything to lock that software down. They want to ensure that, that uh, we all have the same advantage of the code that we develop and, and, and our users do, our customers do, our clients do, the nonprofit down the street does. And nobody can take this and like close it up or make significant changes to it and then go and try to pass it off as another work with a different license or whatever. It's, it's free and it's meant to stay free. And I, I think uh, if, you, if you read the GPL, which isn't that long and it comes with Drupal, you can find it in the uh, license.txt file. If you don't want to read the whole thing, I definitely recommend reading the preamble uh, because they're, they're, they're trying to protect against things like software patents. So like imagine if we as a community developed a views module and then some other company took this views module, made a few changes, redistributed as their own super views module, and then they decided to like patent the query builder or something. And then say, now Drupal, you need to stop using this thing because we own the we own the intellectual property, even though we didn't even develop it. Like that kind of stuff actually has happened, I guess. And so like the GPL is a response to that and kind of an offense against that. Um, so it's so this is how it's carving out a safe place for us as developers because um, we're, we're kind of zero-sum people, I guess, and we don't, I, I don't know, I, maybe not all of us, I don't speak for all the developers in the world or in the room, um, but, if, but if I can see the end game and I don't like where this is going to go, then I'm just not going to start doing something. So if I can see that the code that I'm writing and that I'm, that I'm building is going to just get abused by someone else, well, then I'm just not going to go and do that. I'm not going to contribute to that project. Uh, it's, I, think it's this, I think it's kind of the same reason why we don't have Drupal app stores. Uh, which is, I, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a good thing in, in the sense that an app store is selling code or selling the distribution of code to your website or something. Because we're zero some people and we know that as soon as I try to create some sort of proprietary module and sell that to somebody, well, it's just going to go up on Drupal.org in a new project from the first person who buys it. Or at least I, I like to think that would happen. It hasn't happened. If anybody has some money to blow, I'd like you to go to moneyscripts.net and maybe buy something and put it on Drupal.org. Um, but there are people that do sell Drupal code, but for the, for the most part, we don't value that, we don't incentivize that as a community, uh, and that just doesn't really happen. And, and, and a big reason why is because of this thing that we call the virality of the GPL. Uh, it means that the, the license doesn't extend just to changes that you make to the software or the software itself, but also derivatives and extensions, things that extend the, the, the sort of like base application, like, you might guess, a Drupal module, or like a theme template. Anything that is PHP that you ship for Drupal, actually, if you give it out, must be given out with the GPL as its license. Um, and this, this is, again, how it's, how it's protecting us from, uh, I guess, from abuse. Uh, nobody's going to take my module and redistribute it under some other license. Nobody's going to take something you've written, put it into a little module, and then like try to sell it and sort of cut you out of it or force you to stop distributing it. Uh, so so we, we, we sort of have this, I guess, like 
good good freedom given to us by virtue of the fact that our whole project and everything that we do together is governed by this GPL. And I, and I kind of look at this as sort of like the, I don't know, the law of unintended consequences. I, I don't think that when we got the GPL stuck onto Drupal that we imagined we'd end up where we are with this like super complicated project. Uh, in fact, the, the sort of trend has been away from product toward framework, back toward mishmash product framework kind of thing. Um, but we, like, like, I guess when, whenever Dries picked this license, if I remember the anecdote right, uh, it was more or less a random decision. Kind of like he's in, a, in his dorm room hacking away on this thing and wants to release the code and doesn't really know how you do that. And so he goes to the Free Software Foundation and says, oh, this license sounds good. Click done. And then now we get to deal with the consequence, which is great for us. I mean, and I, I kind of look at, at uh, maybe, the, maybe the Bill of Rights as an analog in that uh, when it, whenever we enshrined in our, in our Constitution the, the, the right to free speech, we had no clue that some of the things that are protected today as free speech uh, were, were being protected then whenever we chose that license to govern our communication in the United States. So what about that learning curve? How, how does the GPL correspond to this thing? Um, <clears throat> So we, I, I hope I've made the case that the GPL has given us a great place to work and operate. And for folks that didn't even know we had it, you have it and you benefit from it. We all benefit from it. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's just a good thing that I haven't spent enough time thinking about and, and considering the implications of. I hope you will after today. But I also want to I, I think about the Drupal learning curve and address this a little bit. Probably not in the way that we'd assume. Like one way you could say is, well, let's just look at this. This is our perception. This is how somebody outside of the Drupal community looks at Drupal. They see, you know, these other systems, competing systems, as simpler to use. They see Drupal as like uh, death-defying, um, very, very difficult uh, venture to embark on. Uh, so let's just make it easier. Let's just let's just simplify. Let's let's chase WordPress towards simplicity, or or Joomla toward prepackaged components, or ModX toward obscurity. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh, but that would be one way to like look at this. It's like, oh, wow, people think that we're difficult. Well, let's, let's have a whole UX initiative and just think about how we can simplify, simplify and reduce the complexity of the software to make it easier. But what people really mean when they say that Drupal is hard and has a learning curve that goes inverted is that programming is hard. Um, when, people, when people put together a Drupal website, it's not like they're using uh, a system that's designed to be used by the casual uh, you know, web enthusiast. What they're really doing is programming an, an entire website using a sort of graphical user interface that we've built called Drupal. And so you can just think about, uh, think about the things that you do when you build a site and also consider just how tame site building sounds in comparison. Uh, when people are building Drupal sites, they're, they're defining um, data structures and entity relationships. Anytime you create a new node type or if you go and build a Drupal Commerce site and add a line item type or a product type or something, you're, you're actually programming when you do that. Uh, you are, what you are doing in the user interface maps directly to a database that's storing this data and then this whole like metadata language that you don't have to worry about that sort of describes the data and the, and the relationships that you're building so that these modules I uh, can then let you extend, you know, I guess build on top of this data. Um, so, so you have to know what data is like and what it's like to map entities together. And you, you kind of have to know like when you're doing something stupid. Uh, and that's difficult. It's really hard to, to get that right. I, st I still don't feel like, like I have arrived there. Anytime I sit down to do a new project, I just like beat my head against the community. Should I use a new node type? Should I write a custom module? What am I doing here? Um, but not only are you defining these data structures and entity relationships, you're also building user interfaces. So you're picking from a library of field widgets how people are going to interact with your node form. And you're rearranging these components so that they're in the most helpful order. And you're providing help text and, and tool tips and helps and whatnot, documentation, you might call it, for your users to know how to build or how to use this system that you've built for them. All right, then we also write database queries. Um, like who, here, who here actually like knows how to write a SQL statement? Okay, who, who knows how to like use views and has no clue how to write a SQL statement? Like, I expected to see hands. Like when you're using the views module, you are actually writing SQL statements. You just don't realize it. You are selecting certain fields from a certain set of database tables that may or may not be joined together and aggregating some of the results and iterating over them and then determining how they're going to be rendered using different display formatters and field plugin, or views plugins and so on and so forth. Like this is really complicated stuff. And it's, it's hard because it's programming. You are programming when you use the views user interface. And that, that, 
it, I guess it, it kind of, uh, it's just kind of funny to me to think about like simplifying the views UI. We have that sort of first step now that's meant to be like, oh, it's really easy to create a view where you can just sort of pick a few different options and say, save, I'm done, and put the block on the side somewhere. But then you hit continue and edit, and it just explodes into like all these like small, like random fields, and some of them, like the names don't match, and I don't know, it's, it's maybe, it's interesting, but what you're doing is writing a database query, and I guess it's actually easier than learning SQL and then try to, trying to make a place to go write that statement, but it's still hard. It's also hard to just know how to render data and to iterate over a result set and make sure it looks how you want it to look. Um, we do that with field formatters. Not only do we use field formatters, we actually give you the ability through the user interface to change, I guess, I guess govern the entire context of the application on any given page request. So you can use the display suite module and create random view modes that then use different formatters and renderers and so on and so forth. Like this is, it, it, this is all like complicated stuff. So it's no wonder that the learning curve looks like that because people aren't saying that Drupal is hard and you guys have a problem, go fix Drupal. They're saying it's programming is hard and, I just, and they just have a lot to learn. There's only so much you can do to simplify that. Uh, and, and if that wasn't bad enough, <laughs> you can actually script the entire freaking website using the rules module, which is a whole programming language built into the user interface. And, and to know how to use this programming language, you have to understand event-driven systems. You have to understand control structures, like if-then conditional statements and loops. Uh, you have to understand subroutines and functions and maybe the difference between the two, if you're coming from a basic background or at least the difference between functions that have a data type and void functions if you're from a C background, but whatever, like, you have to know how to write rules components, we call them, as if, I, I, like, we should have just called them rules functions or subroutines. It would have made it a lot easier for people to, to begin to understand that this is programming. And the hardest thing of all about rules is you have to understand variable scoping, um, which means, like, when do I have access to what data and how do I get that data if I want it and I don't see it somewhere. The, and, and, and I guess, like, it's not just that if you know this stuff already, you can begin to use rules. Because I, I think that even, even though you might be a programmer, when you encounter the rules of UI, you still like, might just be scratching your head and just wondering what in the heck went wrong. I think Andy, 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 you had some trouble with like, the rules of UI just last week, right? Yeah. I have trouble with it, like, probably not last week, but maybe the week before. Um, <laughs> like, this, like this stuff is just hard, but it's because we're trying to create a user interface and a system of, of interoperable modules that let you program a website from the browser. Um, and this is like way left field, but has anybody used Scratch from MIT? Anybody heard of that? Some of us have? Yeah, it's like the same kind of thing, right? It's, it, it, Scratch is like a, a, a graphical user interface for game programming. And, um, and like I, I almost feel like we're doing kids a disservice when we introduce them to programming using this thing, because it, like it, it may actually be a little bit more difficult to use a user interface, because you're, you're having to, to learn how to map programming concepts to this particular UI, what's going to happen when we want to go learn Python or um, FreeBasic? Anybody FreeBasic users? Yes. Awesome. Um, that's, that's how I got into Drupal. So, um, so, so anyways, what people say when they, when they encounter the Drupal learning curve is that uh, Drupal is hard because programming is hard. And, and we shouldn't let them like, get away with just like blaming us or blaming the user interface. We should say, well, like, this is just difficult stuff. It's complicated. And, and, and what we're really providing, with, uh, providing you with through the user interface is unparalleled functionality, unparalleled flexibility, where I can sit down and rapidly prototype a new web application or e-commerce site or whatever in, in hours um, or less, depending on the project. Um, and, and within our community, like, we really value this flexibility. We value this, this high level of fun functionality, even, even to the point where, where we're willing to, like, I guess, like, make up things. Like, well, it's, it's not object-oriented because we couldn't figure out how to get the flexibility one. So we're just sort of like, we're, we're inspired by object-oriented programming. <laughs> that was, that's a Drupalism. Like, oh, it's not truly OO, but well, it's, it's kind of, if you think about hooks and yada yada. Um, what's, a, what's another one? It was on the tip of my tongue, and then I grabbed the water bottle, and uh, it's gone. Anyways, we also, like, we, we lionize developers that sort of lead us in this direction. Um, so, like, like, I love Earl Miles, and I love Wolfgang Ziegler, and that's uh, Merlin of Chaos and Fago, because these guys gave us views and rules. I love CHX and Sun, guys that know how to sit down and, and just build a crazy complex system that's meant to be extended and plugged into. We actually, we even have a whole contributed module devoted to letting you um, use plugin systems in your modules. It's called C tools. If you probably used it unintentionally, but like, like we, we just love this stuff so much that we even make modules about writing other modules. And 
And then we write modules to review the code of our modules, and it's all very meta and, and abstract. Um, but really, this, this gives us a huge competitive advantage over, over any other open source CMS in the market, and certainly over many, if not most, proprietary CMSs. And it, and, it, and it brings, it just sort of lets us bring a lot to the table when we just, just bring Drupal to the table. All right, so none of that would have happened if it weren't for collaboration. Uh, you can't build amazing things like that without the sort of combined effort of, of a diverse group of people. Um, we, we need to be able to specialize. I could never write a query builder, so I'm glad that we have Krell and, uh, and Merlin of Chaos and others in the community, um, CHX, that know how to do that stuff. Um, I, I can do e-commerce things, so I'm glad that I can just focus on my e-commerce component, make sure that it integrates with rules and with views and with the Entity API and with the internationalization module, and then magically turns into an e-commerce framework that works around the world and can be used to build a mom-and-pop store and the Cartier website and launch you know, abstract mobile app stuff uh, for whatever, big corporations, and then also nonprofit donation websites. Like, it does everything and anything in between because I'm building on, like, I guess, the, the back or shoulders of, of all these other people within the Drupal community. And I, I say that the GPL is to blame for this level of collaboration. Therefore, the GPL is to blame for our complexity. It, it inverted our learning curve because it just gave us room to, to roam to express ourselves in this sort of super complex, abstract, flexible way. Uh, but I think that we all benefit from it. And to, and to understand the benefit, I, I, I want to sort of look um, in contrast at other open source projects. One even uses the GPL, but has an incredibly different developer ecosystem because their community ethos wasn't, I think, fully in line with the spirit and intent of the GPL. So um, I'm talking about communities where modules aren't meant to be extended or work together. They're black boxes of functionality. And sometimes, yes, even though they're GPL, they even come with a price tag. Um, so, it, so it blows my mind when I go to the Joomla extensions directory and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm just looking at you know, Joomla plugins and they don't, they don't have like a centralized distribution mechanism. When you want to download one of their extensions, you click download and it really takes you away to the developer's website. And at many of these developers' websites, you don't just see a download link or a tarball like you would expect. You see a buy button. And we're thinking, how in the world does this happen? This project is also GPL. That means this PHP code is also sort of virally infected by the GPL. How do they do it? Well, it's because their community facilitates this. If they had a, a community repository like Drupal.org, where you can only check in GPL code and you can never put a paywall in front of it, well, then, then I guess uh, in their community, their developers would not have been incentivized to monetize their extensions and their plugins. In the Drupal community, we incentivize collaboration. And we do that by our adherence to our license, our championing of it, um, by the, the sort of virality debates that we get into elsewhere on the internet, um, and just, just by our, our general community ethos from Dries at the top, sort of all the way on down, which when I say like top and down, what I really mean is like just, it's around the round table, kind of, um, because we all own this. Um, but, but here in Joomla world, their developers have been incentivized to build a silo of functionality. And this, this was really clear to me at um, the CMS Expo a couple of years ago where I was talking to the, uh, the, the team behind Tienda. And, and they do something that I would say is, is a little bit better in that they don't sell their code. They just sort of sell a six-month support contract that goes with it. And they just make sure the, the, the buy button for the support contract is a little more prominent than just the free download link. Um, Fair enough, okay, they're making money, they're doing stuff. They're giving stuff away for free if you know how to find it. Um, <clears throat> but they had to build their own rules, and they had to build their own views, and they had to build their own templating system for their product pages. They had to do a heck of a lot that I never have to do and never want to do and never want to touch um, to get their e-commerce system like market ready. Um, I just have to define uh, a few e-commerce related data types and systems um, we, we just define, you know, products and line items and orders and customer profiles and payment transactions, a shopping cart system, a checkout system, a payment system, and a product pricing system with taxes and shipping and whatnot plugging into it. Define those things and then how that gets uh, stored in the database, presented to users, rendered, etc. How you program that with rules, all that stuff's up to you. We hard code literally none of the business logic and have to hard code none of the presentation, which is perfect for me because I suck on the front end. That's why these slides aren't that great. Um, <laughs> I suck at the front end, but I but I can do this stuff. I can I can program Drupal modules and I and I sort of 
I get and I kind of like abstract complexity. And so like this is a, a safe place for me to do this without worrying that somebody else is going to go package it up into a black box and sell it for 150 bucks, and then maybe get the community to, to remove my listing from the extensions directory. Who knows? Anyways, uh, I'm not just going to pick on one person. I'll pick on someone that's a lot easier to pick on because they sold out. Um, talking about Magento, um, sold to eBay. And, uh, and they, they're sort of one of those open source and name only projects um, where, where it's not like a community project. Um, you won't just like join their community and suddenly become like a core contributor, maybe even a maintainer, like you will in Drupal. Um, just ask Angie Byron where she was like six years ago. Um, in, instead, it's, it's, a, it's a dual licensed thing. You can get the community edition for free and then you can pay like I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to get the enterprise version, um, which does things like you might find in Drupal out of the box. Um, but they're selling licenses. They they have this license model, and their developer ecosystem again incentivizes people to build silos of functionality, where they can sell and nickel and dime you to build uh, an e-commerce store that actually like implements best practices. Um, that kind of thing. So if you want extension plugins, you have to go find them from this sort of um, company-controlled walled garden of um, extensions that are open source, um, but uh, but the, that aren't, I guess. <laughs> at least at least they're they're open source, but they're not free. Uh, they're not free as in freedom. If you want to borrow from the GPL v3. So in, in other words, um, just because you're open source, and even just because you're the GPL. Uh, I guess it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the same path that we've had in Drupal, but it has given us a lot of room to run, and it's resulted in a great project, a great community, a great set of tools that we all get to use for free. Um, and, I, and I guess I think that what we have is special. Um, I, I really do. I think it's a great place to be. I think it's a great community to be a part of. And I love contributing code to Drupal. Uh, I have never once written a module and thought, okay, how can I monetize this? I never even had to consider that. How's somebody else going to monetize this? I've never, I've never thought maybe I shouldn't post a patch to this guy's module because he's just selling it, and I get no benefit from that. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but, I, but I have thought, okay, just about any problem out there. Well, what kind of module could I write to solve that problem? Um, and and I felt very free to give back, and and apparently a lot of other people have too. Uh, so. When I say the GPL is responsible for Drupal's complexity, I'm saying it gave us a safe place to collaborate and share our code without threats of, of abuse or misuse or even material damage to our businesses. Um, and what we did because of our community ethos and our DNA and you know the sort of like hacker culture and computer scientist founding and all that kind of stuff is we took that and made a complex project because we could. And now we love using it. And I think that that complexity is a good thing. So the title was hopelessly reductionistic, um, and it even sounded a little bit negative. Uh, but actually, I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing it's difficult, because the fact that we've built a new programming language that's like browser-based uh, means we can do a heck of a lot in a short amount of time. Um, we, can, we can very easily uh, rapidly prototype like complicated web applications. Um, I, does anybody do MUDs? MUD coding? Yeah. All right, my free basic deed. All right, we are separated at birth, man. <laughs> um, does anybody know what mods are? No. All right, we played World of Warcraft or seen it played. Maybe we can go back in history a little bit. You had like Ultima Online, maybe before that ever. Wait, EverQuest? Then I can't remember the lineage. Anyways, they're they're text-based multiplayer role-playing games uh, that I still happen to like, and that a dude from FIT uh, works on, and I was working on one with him, and. and uh, we were literally just like using like Facebook messages as, as our issue tracker. I said, dude, this is stupid. Uh, I'm going to build you an issue tracker real quick. Let's use this thing. And like, he's like, okay, well, but, you know, it's, for him, it's like a waste of time. How, how long are you going to you know, sink into setting something up that's not going to be helpful? And so like an hour later, I'm like, so here's our issue tracker. Go use this. You know, stop emailing and um, whatever else. And, and so it was like within an hour, I had like a full issue tracker that um, did everything we needed for our project. Uh, and that's, that, that's rapid prototyping. You can't do that with a lot of tools out there, um, especially building something that the software wasn't designed to do. Drupal was not designed to be an issue tracker system, um, but hey, I could do it, and so I did. Um, we can also quickly integrate new APIs into the whole of the ecosystem. Drupal is meant to be extended. It's meant to be pluggable, and so it's, it's very easy to, to go and find uh, a new API that gets developed, a new service, and just sort of like bring them to bear to the whole of the Drupal community. Um, 
this guy named Rob Loach. I believe he still works for Aquium. Somebody can tell me. No, okay. Yeah, like for a while, um, anytime some new web service came out that I thought was cool, I was like, man, I wonder if there's a module for that. He'd done it. Um, like I think he did the, the okay, Discus or Discuss? Discuss. Okay. That's very disappointing. Uh, I said discus. <laughs> uh, but like discuss, like he, he had that sucker integrated like in no time flat. So you could use it on a Drupal blog instead of Drupal's core commenting system. It was very easy for him to do that. I recently did this with a recommendations engine called Relify, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but but that's, that's a huge competitive advantage for Drupal. And it's also um, a reason for startups to like Drupal. Um, the startup community should be all over Drupal. Because they're always talking about minimum viable product, rapid prototyping, agile development. Drupal supports these things, but instead, for some reason, Ruby and Node and other systems have become the sort of language and framework of, of the day for, for the startup ecosystem. But why not Drupal? Um, so I'm, I'm active in our local um, accelerator, pitching Drupal to these guys and Drupal Commerce to um, the e-commerce guys and, and doing my part, I suppose, and to show them like the... the just the, the sheer advantage and the competitive advantage that Drupal and our community and our library of tools will give them. And so I did that recently. I went to this hackathon. And um, within 24 hours, I was able to take Relify's API and integrate it with Drupal. It's an API for doing recommendations, um, just any kind of content, product, et cetera, recommendation. Um, and they, they sort of let you create your, your sort of NoSQL database by defining all the different keys and parameters that you're going to store in there, saying this is my user key, this is my item key, and then building recommenders that can find most similar or um, maybe personalized recommendations for a particular user. Uh, and so like, I sort of looked at this thing and said, well, we need product recommendations in Drupal Commerce. You have a recommendations engine as a service. I can do this. And uh, so I sat down um, as a solo team. Typically at a hackathon, I think you're supposed to like collaborate with people. Um, <laughs> But on my headphones, I was nose down. And for I, I think I had about 12 hours of programming in during the course of that 24-hour time period or whatever. Um, and when I was done, um, I had a full user interface um, within Drupal that essentially like, um, was, was a little bit easier to use than their own user interface to, to define your data sets, um, to uh, um, seed data into them, to build recommenders and then to request recommendations, cache them locally, and then actually put them into view so that you could, uh, whenever you add a product to the shopping cart in Drupal Commerce, see, you might also love this product. You know, 15 out of 15 customers that got this one also bought this one, that, that kind of thing. So with, from within 24 hours start to finish, I had like an actual complete integration of their service into Drupal. And then now I'm going to blog about it and talk about it and write about it and show Drupal Commerce users how to use them to do product recommendations. It's great for their business. It was great for their service because I, I, I found a few bugs uh, and crashed a few things. And, um, and he got to practice uh, scaling up new dynamos to, uh, uh, new dynos to, uh, to power his thing on Amazon or whatever. Um, but but they, they really benefited from that because now they got to actually see someone take their API and make, like I guess, kind of productize it in a sense. Like actually open a new channel for them um, to, to get sales. And it was really exciting to them because literally nobody else at the hackathon actually got to implementing the API. Um, so I was the only one, so I won. <laughs> um, but that's cool. Uh, I got to take them with Spark Fun Inventors Kit. It's a little Arduino board and fun stuff like that. Um, so this kind of thing can happen in other cities. This should happen in New York City. This should happen in San Francisco, LA, etc. I don't know where else there are startup communities. I know Atlanta, we have a good relationship with MailChimp, and I'm sure they're doing stuff there locally. <laughs> This kind of thing can happen, uh, and, it, and it gets us outside of the Drupal bubble and helps us begin to take Drupal to new markets, um, which is something that like all of us big companies are still trying to figure out. Well, one lone hacker can go and do the same thing and maybe even have more exposure and more reach than a company could ever get with their marketing budgets and directors and buzzwords and all that. Um, so it's, it's worked out great at commerce, guys. Um, our vision is for Drupal to be the number one open source e-commerce platform in the world. Uh, and, and we focus on truly flexible e-commerce. That's how we think we're going to arrive there. So in other words, we've embraced the inverted learning curve. Uh, and we've said this is a good thing. And, uh, and we, we've shown people why. Um, we've shown people that, that it's empowered us to build Commerce Kickstart 2, uh, which is the, this uh, kind of thing. Oh, uh, I shouldn't have done that. It's going to screw up everything, huh? Yeah, let's just go back. Now I'm going to have to start back at the beginning of my slides. 
I didn't have to start back at the beginning of my slides. All right, we're not going to go to the browser. Commerce Kickstart. Josh will show it off later today. But it's just, it's just like crazy, complicated distribution of Drupal that we were able to... Did I screw something up? I screwed something up. Just click on your slide. Boom. Thanks. You were a little late. <laughs> and we're back. All right. So uh, PowerPoint is not GPL. Um, and it's still complex, <laughs> and neither is OSX. Um, anyways, we were empowered to take the code and build a product with it that is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with closed source and open source competitors uh, and winning, winning bids against Demandware, against Hybris, against Magento. We're doing that. And the GPL and Drupal's complexity let us do that, and it lets us make money, which is great. I love making money as a business. It's, it's really good for us. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's, it's good for us because we, uh, this, this code doesn't just benefit us, it benefits everybody, uh, and it helps us pay our employees and come to fun events and sponsor things and do cool stuff. Um, but, but this code also makes its way back into dozens of contributed projects and into Drupal Core itself in the form of maybe patches to the installer because we really like rocked the installation process. Uh, but also in Drupal 8, the entity reference field started out as a prototype for work that we were doing at Commerce Guys. Then got released as a contributed project, far eclipsed Drupal Commerce, um, and then now got put into Drupal 8 itself. In other words, that's another way of saying uh, we, we are contributing to the learning curve uh, because the entity reference module is abstracting once again away from use case specific modules like node reference, user reference, etc., that you can have simpler widgets for and now making everything be even more abstract and even more difficult to use. But it's a good thing because it also lets you do more with less code. I'm going to remove um, thousands of lines of code in Drupal Commerce whenever we port to Drupal 8 because I don't have to define a product reference field and a customer profile reference field any longer. And those reference fields are going to be more powerful in Drupal 8 than they are right now in Drupal Commerce and Drupal 7. So it's working um, and you can still build a for-profit enterprise. This doesn't prevent you from doing that. The GPL doesn't prevent you from making money. You actually could go and sell a CD of Drupal if you could find someone to buy it. That'd be pretty fun. <laughs> um, be really interesting. I'd, I'd support that if you did that, um, just because you would be awesome. Um, so it's working at Commerce, guys. I know it's working in other businesses. I know it's working for Acquia. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't have like four people in the in, in the Octo, the office of the CTO, hacking away on Drupal full time. I know it's working at um, Media Current, or they wouldn't afford to be platinum sponsors of. Florida Drupal Camp. I know it's working in basically any, any Drupal shop out there. This just works, and I think it's great. It does mean we've sort of embraced the inverted learning curve, um, but the GPL let us do that, and we all get to benefit from it. So, thanks for listening. Please send your flames, difficult questions, contradictions uh, to Ryan at CommerceGuys.com, or tweet them out and shame me in public, uh, or I'm happy to talk about it after the session, or anything else that I mentioned that I enjoy talking about. Um, but thanks a lot, and I hope you have a great camp, and I hope this sort of taught you something new if you've never heard of the GPL before. Um, the end. Yeah.